Welcome to this uh, to kit webinar on uh, managing an effective transition from 2013 uh, to the 2022 version of 27001. Just very briefly cover who we are, uh, who we are at CertiKit. Um, so we're a leading creator of compliance toolkits um, um, and uh, we're also a provider of ISO uh, consultancy services. Um, we're headquartered in, in Derbyshire. Um, We've sort of been in existence since I think about 2010 and we've sort of helped uh, more than 4,000 customers globally. I think that's that's been growing uh, since the number of years Ted and myself have been with the company. Um, we're sort of helping a number of customers achieve compliance um, to the various ISO standards. Uh, we specialise uh, primarily in the core ISO standard, so that's sort of 9001, 14, 27001. Uh, we've now increasingly getting some work in 22301, etc. And we've also uh, specialised in, in uh, standards around data protection compliance as well. Um, our mission really is to make compliance easy so that, you know, more organisations like yourself can achieve certification um, to the various standards and benefit from the, the chosen standard or, or the data protection regulations. So that's a bit about CertiKit. Uh, a bit about myself. Um, I'm uh, responsible for... Um, providing both internal audit consultancy and uh, for ISO 27001 information security management um, to new and current CertiKit customers uh, and providing guidance and advice when needed to customers who are implementing 27001 using our 27001 toolkit. Um, the boring bits. <laughs> um, I'm a certified lead implementer uh, to 27001 and qualified 27001 lead auditor uh, in both uh, 27001 and 9001. Um, had a variety of experience over my career, sort of over the last 25 years, I've sort of been involved in quality management roles within manufacturing and various industries, uh, both in and information security management uh, within aerospace, defence and software development sectors. Um, experience really in implementing a number of ISO certifications uh, within a number of companies I've worked at, both in 9001 and 27001. Um, Okay, so just as a reminder again, before we progress, if you've got any questions, just drop them in there question window at the end. So we'll start uh, with the presentation formally. OK, so what we're going to cover today, uh, so we'll take a look a little bit about what how the standards evolved since its original version uh, back in 2000. Won't focus too much on the history, but um, just sort of how it morphed into uh, what is currently the new 2022 version. Um, we'll take a look at how the 2013 version of the standard was structured in terms of uh, the Annex A control structure um, and some of the revised control groupings that uh, were introduced into the the current standard. Uh, we'll take a, a brief look at some of the key differences, um, what was introduced new into the standard, what was sort of merged and removed. Uh, it won't be a deep dive, uh, but it will be enough for you to sort of understand at least what new controls and that were brought in. Um, and uh, then um, well, you know, one, one of the things I would recommend that if you are going to be uh, either going on the 27,001 journey or on the transition journey, that you do at least buy, you know, procure a copy of the 27002 2022 guidance, uh, because that will give you a detailed description of what the controls um, are all about. So um, we won't have time today to, to go into that level of depth. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit as well about transition planning and then a little bit about the sort of process um, for integrating uh, to the new version. So the main things, uh, objectives of today is you'll have some understanding of the common structure of the 27001, what changes were brought in as part of the management system elements, uh, what revisions came into the Annex A controls, um, and then towards the end, I'll also give a few little hints and tips on, on some of the things 
that we've experienced as, as um, uh, you know, being gap areas, I suppose, or things that I've I've experienced uh, when auditing in pre-certification or during implementation and working with clients that are transitioning from the old version to the new new standard and some of the things that uh, we've learned from that exercise. Okay, um, so I'll rattle through the first bit. Um, so going right back to the evolution of uh, the standard, it originally started life as a British standard, funny enough, in 2000, uh, BS 7799. Uh, there were two parts to it. Uh, part one, which was the best practice bit about information security, it drew a lot of inspiration, I think, uh, presumably from other areas like NIST and, and so on. And then part two, which was the actual implement ISMS bit. Um, it got revised in 2005 because that's when it officially became the 27001 standard. Um, so that was effectively the, the first revision of it. Um, However, what we're here to talk about today is the 2013 to 2022. So just a little bit about 2013. That was really when the original 2005 uh, version got updated. Um, and the main revisions there was that um, it, it mainly uh, was updated to align, um, particularly in the uh, management system aspects with the, the um, Annex SL format, which is a common structure across um, all the core ISO standards like 9, 14, uh, 27, and uh, anything which has got a, a management system aspect to it. Um, so that Annex SL format was probably the biggest change to come in prior, uh, when it was introduced in 2013. Um, when it comes to the 2022 version, uh, to be honest, it was a little bit underwhelming. Um, it wasn't a radical update. Um, it was more of a sort of a nip and tuck exercise. Um, that happened on the Annex A control. It provided some logical uh, grouping of controls. Um, um, it also introduced the, the concept of uh, properties or attributes that you could apply to the controls so that you can uh, group them from a perspective of what are the characteristics um, that that uh, particular control will uh, contribute to preserving. Um, the other thing was that there was a bit of a reshuffling of the, of the deck chair, so I'll, I'll come on to that in the next slide. So uh, the main components of the standard are the clauses 4 to 10. That remained the same and it always has been uh, for anything that follows the Annex SL format. Uh, that, that is basically the, the core um, management system uh, elements of the standard. Uh, when you drill down then into the, the, the controls, the 2013 uh, was originally structured into like 14 domains. Um, they were numbered A5 through to A18 um, and there was 114 controls in total. That got rejigged in the 2022 version where they actually came up with uh, what they call four um, sort of themes. Um, those themes were numbered A5, A6, A7 and A8 and I'll come on to that uh, a bit later and then uh, the controls were revised down a little bit into 93 um, controls. Uh, the principle remains the same though is that the controls that the organisation implements should be based on the results of the risk assessment and then obviously you select and tailor those according to the particular risks that you have. So let's just start a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned there, there were some structure and format changes to Annex A. Um, that also uh, supposedly um, was to also allow for better alignment with other ISO management system standards, particularly, um, you know, with the Annex SL format. Uh, the management system itself introduced a new clause 6.3. Um, which was called IS um, change uh, planning and management. And that was introduced really to emphasize the need for organizations to more systematically plan and implement and review changes into the ISMS. I think one thing that was inherent in standards like 9001, it was a little bit, shall we say, a bit more robust and that when it came to wanting to document changes 
um, in terms of uh, plan changes to the management system. It was a little bit lax uh, in the 27,001. I think my, from what I could gather, um, they were probably doing audits, not seeing much evidence that organisations were actually planning and implementing um, changes to the ISMS uh, effectively. So this new clause uh, came into to being. Um, still emphasise a risk-based approach though, but it did enhance um, the focus on the risk-based approach more for information security and uh, obviously still reinforcing that organisation, organisations need to implement those controls uh, based on the specific risks that have identified in the risk assessment. Okay, um, one other key difference as well is that the 27,002 uh, guidance actually came out ahead of the publish, uh, publishing of the 27,001 standard. Uh, so obviously, uh, in order to not shoot themselves in the foot, it was probably uh, very appropriate that the Annex A controls and everything were, were strictly aligned to uh, the 27,002 2022 um, guidance. It would have been a bit embarrassing if they were not the same. And that obviously would ensure consistency and clarity. And, uh, providing and applying those controls. The other key shift slightly in the 2022 was there was a slight more emphasis uh, on cybersecurity aspects and obviously it was refreshed to keep it in, in line with um, you know changes in updates in technology and how to protect those information assets in the more modern um, ITT environment rather than um, the the environments that would have existed back in 2013. Okay, uh, so I want to just get this out of the way now because uh, you know once I've discussed this, uh, you know it's uh, one thing off the list. Um, but um, in February this year, the IEF and the ISO organisations um, did publish a joint communicate to highlight um, the um, climate change amendments. Uh, now this was uh, across the board, um, across many standards. It wasn't just to 27,001, it was to 9, 14, etc. Now the main thing was is that uh, you, you think to yourself, well, how does climate change, how can we address that within? Um, but the, the standard already has a, a mechanism really within within the early clauses, particularly in, in uh, clause four uh, through clause 4.1 and 4.2. Um, they remain unchanged basically, but you can actually consider really, will climate change have an effect or not on your management system? Um, and if you need to evaluate whether it would or would not have that in effect, and then you can cover that off uh, quite adequately by um, the current clauses of 4.1, which is um, uh, internal and external issues, um, and then through 4.2, interested parties. So the main recommendation how to deal with the uh, this um, you know this published change is to basically make sure that clause 4.1 uh, internal and external issues highlights uh, climate change and determines the necessary impacts if there are any at all on your particular activities um, and just demonstrate um, keep keep records uh, as part of the evaluation that you do uh, for the internal and external issues just uh, keep make sure that you document that it has been considered and if it is or has not been determined if it's actually relevant to your management system at all so they're not saying that climate change has to be relevant, you have to evaluate it in the line of the business activities that you do uh, and its relevancy to your ISMS. So that's the way to cover that particular new requirement off. So let's just have a, a quick, I talked about earlier, you know, the, the way that the uh, Annex A controls have been structured. So they brought in um, four control structures, um, A5, called organisational controls. Um, funny enough, 
most of those controls, not all, but most sort of aligned to some of the ones that were sort of in that early uh, series of controls in the old, in the 2013 standard. Uh, but they grouped 37 controls into that. Um, they grouped uh, things like vetting and a lot of the people oriented things like, uh, you know, Job, uh, job descriptions, training, that sort of thing, uh, in, into the people controls. Uh, they grouped all the physical security things together, um, and there was 14 of those brought, brought under A7. And then lastly, all of the good cyber controls and access controls and all of the good stuff uh, got brought into um, things like um, uh, the A8 technological controls. Okay, uh, so what were the new controls? Um, so just before I go into into these at a, an overview level, I just wanted to stress and, and again a reminder uh, that Annex A controls are selective. Um, so just because these are new controls that have been added into the standard, it doesn't necessarily mean that they automatically become relevant and Interestingly, I've got into some interesting uh, healthy debates, I won't call them arguments, with uh, some certification auditors that seem to think that just because they've introduced these as new controls, that they are, uh, you know, they're something that the business needs to be doing. And I stress that, again, you, you need to go back to your risk assessments and determine what risks you've got. Uh, and select the controls that are going to be the controls that will mitigate and treat those risks. Now, you can additionally pick and choose additional controls. You don't have to necessarily always have a, a risk in your risk assessment to cover it. But I must stress that just because I'm telling you here that these are new controls that got brought in, it doesn't automatically mean that you have to do them all. It's what's relevant to your business. So if we take a look at the first one, uh, threat intelligence, um, that was a new uh, control that came in in order to sort of provide a, a more sort of proactive structure to reacting to and planning and uh, doing preventive measures towards known threats um, and vulnerabilities. So it's interesting that 5.7 comes after 5.6 in the controls which is contact with special interest groups and that I think is a good input source to feeding threat intelligence you know you you either members of uh, professional bodies or um, you know your memberships are, uh, subscribe to newsletters all of that sort of thing so this gives you a good source of inputs to feed into threat intelligence um, it also requires you to, you know, deal, identify those threats, triage them and determine what impact they will or will not have. And then some means of, of documenting what corrective and preventive measures that you've got. Next one is uh, information security for use of cloud. Um, this is a new control because obviously um, businesses uh, have gradually migrated away from having on-premise, um, you know, infrastructure and IT infrastructure, and, and uh, a lot of businesses have found that, particularly in the pandemic, having cloud um, services is is a lot more um, easier to um, uh, to sort of manage and make available, um, and also. But the problem is with this is that you're trading certain types of risks off for different types of risks. So the standard brought this in now to get you to think a little bit about, you know, when you adopt cloud services, you know, what are the risks that are, are around the use of cloud services? Um, and also, you know, in, in terms of working with cloud service providers, uh, making sure that, that, you know, that you do due diligence and, uh, you, you know, that you, you actually work out things like where the data's, where your data's been stored and make sure that the data in the cloud is adequately protected. Next one, uh, ICT readiness. Um, yeah, this one's an interesting one because uh, 
from my experience, business continuity planning has often been a bit of an afterthought in a lot of cases. And quite often, as we as consultants have, have seen a lot of business continuity plans that when you look at them in depth, they're actually unworkable in practice. And, and you do question, well, if a disaster struck you tomorrow, would you actually be able to uh, effectively recover? Um, so uh, this here is a really good requirement that, you know, um, really gets you to think about making sure that, um, you know, you've got resilient plans for recovery. You can actually genuinely support your business operations uh, through disruption um, to obviously minimise um, downtime and data loss. Um, one of the things I would also recommend, you know, that um, although it's an unwritten rule, if you actually read carefully the guidance, um, we would recommend, you know, doing a more structured approach to business impact analysis, looking at your dependencies, recovery times, and then define a proper plan based on, you know, the critical system recovery. Physical security monitoring, that just improved uh the detection oops sorry uh the detection and response capabilities around physical security that's looking about critical where where there are critical zones or critical areas um within the business that do need you know additional levels of protection and uh, this can in, involve things like um you know cctv monitoring or additional access monitoring and control that sort of thing Configuration management, this was a new control that came in really to try and get people to think a little bit about, you know, don't just implement, um, you know, uh, an IT system or a network or, um, you know, a laptop, deploy a laptop without having some standards around what the, that configuration ought to be uh, because obviously if things are configured differently or not to a certain standard that can obviously um, introduce risk and um, by doing configuration management properly that's obviously going to impact on your um, you know uh, enable you to reduce vulnerabilities uh, arising from different configurations and and unauthorized changes uh, information deletion, quite self-explanatory, really. Uh, it was just l l this one really is all about um, a little bit about document retention and making sure that when things come to end of life and you do need to securely dispose and remove uh, data that, um, you know, is deleted and, and done in a, a controlled uh, manner because uh, there's nothing worse than deleting a whole load of data down that you think is now beyond its retention period only to find out that it's irrecoverable now and, and there is a circumstance where you do need to recover. Next one, uh, data masking. Um, not always relevant to every, this is probably one of those controls depending on what your business is and, and what you do, um, but really this is about um, you know, protecting things like sensitive data or PI data, and particularly if you send such data externally, um, you know, it's about making the data unintelligible or obfuscating it uh, and making sure that only the people that uh, should be receiving such data, you know, are, are able to, um, uh, you, you know, uh, decrypt that data and, and use it for its intended purposes. Uh, the whole idea behind it is obviously to reduce data, potential of data breaches, particularly if you're, you know, handling PI data. Some of the techniques are pure um, pseudonymization of the data. Um, uh, some could be unrecoverable, you know, it uses hashes and depends on what the, the recipient of the data is doing with it. Data leakage protection, uh, this came in to get you, you know, uh, business to think a little bit about uh, unauthorized access uh, to information uh, and protecting um, that data uh, from leaving the business. Um, 
various measures, the policy measures, procedural measures and monitoring can come into this, but also there are now uh, advances in technology with DLP tools, which will enable you to actually monitor a little bit more effectively, you know, masses of data being emailed externally or, or um, data transferred to um, storage devices and, and so on. Monitoring, uh, this was a new requirement. Um, it sort of builds on 8.15, which is uh, logging, um, but it's all right logging, you know, in today's systems, you can log lots of data, you can log whatever you like and hold terabytes of log data. But really, this gets you to the little bit a bit more about, well, what's critical to monitor? You know, what do we need to monitor? Um, and, uh, you know, how are we going to monitor it? And, um, you know, how frequently and who's responsible and so on. Web filtering. Uh, quite straightforward this one this is really just to reduce risk of malware infections and things so just by restricting access to to websites and to other resources um, externally secure coding um, this was brought in really um, to ensure really that software development if you're into software development uh, uh, of applications or, or websites or whatever, web applications. It's just to think a little bit about what some of the vulnerabilities are uh, whilst you're doing uh, the development. Uh, so if you're into web, you can use things like OWASP, OWASP Top 10. Uh, if you're into application developments and things, it's uh, using of tools like static code tools and, and that to help to identify weaknesses and vulnerabilities in, in the code and applications, things like peer review and, and uh, technical review, that sort of thing. So, and, and incorporate that as part of your software development life cycle. Uh, disruptive events, self-explanatory really, um, is just making sure that there are adequate protective measures um, you know, during disruptive events, this could be things like mirroring of servers and switching, you know, automatic failovers, this sort of thing, uh, and just being robust to uh, when times when uh, things like power cuts or outages or server outages, this sort of thing, uh, can be of a, a critical importance to your business. User endpoint protection. This was a bit of a um, amalgamation of a, of a few controls, really. But uh, really, at the end of the day, this is just making sure that um, you know uh, end users' devices, laptops, mobiles, and things have adequate uh, means of protection in case of loss or theft or, or cyber um, uh, cyber uh, risks, and uh, you know providing whatever technologies are available to to control those endpoint devices. So they were the new controls. Um, I'll very briefly go through this. There were some merge controls. Um, so uh, what, what used to be as part of A7 uh, controls and terms and conditions, these all got merged and, and brought into the people controls uh, part of the standard. Um, what used to be in A8, uh, the old A8 uh, for classification, labeling and handling, they were sort of consolidated and streamlined and then they were brought into uh, the organizational controls group. Uh, I think classification of information and labeling um, still sort of exists as, as unique controls um, uh, in their own right. Uh, removed and absorbed controls, so uh, removal of assets, uh, that, that got absorbed into a number of controls really. So things like user endpoint devices, control, um, you know that that can uh, sort of um, uh, be a be an end, uh, a control that is used. Uh, information deletion as well, uh, and physical threats, um, and then secure development policy. That sort of got absorbed in a lot of the controls that is now part of a um, the the new A825 through to A829 controls as part of the um, software development lifecycle um, controls. 
Okay, a little bit about uh, the difference then between sort of going through a full implementation. Uh, I won't go through every step. Uh, that's what is our typical 10-step, uh, high-level 10-step process for doing a full implementation. Uh, there are a number of sub-steps in, in uh, each of these, which I won't go into today. We've got a different webinar on what our 10-step process actually um comprises of um, but really for a, a transition you don't really need to um, go through all of the steps again because you've effectively you've got your management system you've got most of the infrastructure in place it's all about managing the changes um, so um, as identified really in the earlier slide, the introduction of the new version of the standard brought in not only a restructuring of the control categories, but also introduced new and revised controls as well. Uh, it's important to understand uh, what these new requirements um, are. Um, so on my next slide, I'll go into a little bit about it's important really, and we would recommend always doing a sort of a gap assessment to evaluate what are your existing process and determining level of compliance it could be that you haven't got anything or it could be that you've got something that may fit uh, the requirements of the new controls so the gap assessment will at least allow you to um, identify that and see what can be leveraged if there is anything uh, or what is actually missing and that will help you in later steps of planning the changes appropriately um, on the scope and effects um, on interested parties, uh, bringing in the new control obviously has an impact on the scope uh, because you're now bringing in new activities that um, are potentially um, now being performed um, that are part of uh, which weren't originally in scope. So. Um, as I said before, you know, don't just accept because they brought the new controls in that they immediately become relevant. But obviously, if you've decided those new controls are relevant to you, then you have to weigh up. Well, you know, what effect does that have on our scope uh, of our business activities that are included? Because clearly any new controls you bring in are, are of interest to your cert body because they will need to evaluate those um, now, which they previously wouldn't have uh, evaluated them and then you also have to look at well have we got any uh, interested parties who are now involved in the operation or whatever of those processes so you need to, to sort, of, um, a sort of assess what the effects are on those um, uh, on the scope and the interested parties themselves um, an example of that is um, how could the introduction of a new control impact um, an interested party? Well, for example, we mentioned the use of cloud services. So if you uh, do start using cloud services and you start implementing the controls around cloud services, then clearly um, you're going to have some new interested parties that need to be updated in your interested parties because those, uh, and they become critical uh, interested parties because they're providing critical services uh, to your business. Um, next step really then is uh, once you've sort of assessed the impacts and controls, done the gap assessment, uh, is updating your risk assessments and any treatment. So, um, you know, additional risks need to be brought into your risk assessment um, and then obviously any uh, new treatments that may result from any risks that are uh, above your current uh, treat threshold uh, need to be um, uh, also handled. Impacts on the ISMS, um, so you've established what risks or any new risks you've identified uh, then uh, you know what new policies procedures and technical measures uh, that are going to be needed um, and then any existing policy procedure changes can be identified um, I talked earlier about this new require this new clause 6.3 which is plan changes um, that's a new requirement so it's important that you don't just go and change or, or introduce new policy procedure without going through the ISMS change uh, process. So that means documenting all the changes 
that are going to be formally planned uh, and that will ensure there's traceability on why those changes are needed, what will be changed and when they're implemented. And again, this provides you good evidence to your CERT body as well that you've thought very carefully about what those changes are and what impact they have and what procedures and things are impacted by it. Okay, um, so just a little bit about the gap analysis. We, we said that, you know, the, the steps to assess the current compliance the new requirements is one of the key reasons for doing a gap assessment. Determination of where the new controls can apply or not. Uh, requiring what the updates are and feeding them into the change process. And the, the reason that gets more formally recorded and evidence is because generally the ISMS change will process will have some sort of change log or change records and then obviously there's the revision records to the documents themselves. Important thing to do then once you've sort of identified uh, all of the um, things that do need uh, changing and updating and what the impacts are uh, is, is like anything, uh, treat it as a, as a project. Um, and like any project, like your main 27001 implementation, develop a transition roadmap. Use your gap analysis as a core input to that to determine what needs changing. Feed those changes into the ISMS change process and then create a step by step plan for doing the transition. I'm sure I don't really need on this webinar to tell you how to plan uh, a project plan, uh, but that's effectively uh, what I would do. Then you've got a clear uh, outline then about how long this is all going to take, um, you know, and, and so on. Obviously set clear timelines and milestones about when you want to achieve particular uh, objectives and, and changes. And um, one thing I want to um, sort of talk about is uh, what if you can't get it all done by the transition deadline? Well, at the moment, the transition deadline is the 31st of October 2025. And what, what that means is that after that date, the CERT bodies will no longer be offering uh, to um, uh, companies that are already certified to the 2013 standard uh, a transition path to get to 2022. It also means as well that if you're a, an organisation that is new to doing 27001, you won't be uh, uh, able to certify after that date at all to the old standard. Um, you will have to align all of your um, uh, requirements to and uh, your policies, procedure, etc., to the 2022 standard. So let's just say you're only part way down or just thinking about transitioning to the new standard you know some of these things i, I as as i've said you know there's the, a lot of new controls to think about some are easy some are difficult um you know what happens if you can't actually achieve that by the transition deadline well don't panic uh, the next slide i'll hopefully cover off how i would do it if say you're encroaching towards that deadline and you've not quite got everything uh, all in place um so the solution to this is um in at the moment the 27001 uh, in clause 613 it requires you to produce an soa document and the soa uh, comprises of a number of requirements that says about documenting the controls to meet the risks and blah blah blah, blah. Um, but the key thing is you need to justify why they're in, their inclusion you know why they're relevant to your business but the next bullet is actually uh, the key one here uh, whether the necessary controls are implemented or not so within the um, SOA for uh, for for 27001 you can say that a control is applicable to you but at the moment it's not yet implemented so that if you like is your get out clause or or shall we say buys you a bit of time to say well um you know it is applicable we've we've thought about this that control is perfectly relevant uh, both to meet a risk or an, or an internal desire to to do that control um, but we've not yet implemented it um, 
but you can't just say that and not do anything and say that in your SOA. So um, how do you back that up with hard evidence that a, a cert body will be happy with to, to say, well, OK, well, you've not implemented it yet. When are you going to implement it and what is it you're going to do to actually get there? So this is uh, where we would recommend um, the, the next step. So. You've got all of this stuff you need to change. Um, my recommendation would be probably a, an inverse. A lot of people was, would say, well, work on the large changes because they're going to take you longer. But I think whenever it's like anything, when there's a deadline looming, what tends to happen in reality is people rush to meet the deadline. And in my experience, um, you know, that can be uh, a road to disaster really because it's better to plan and implement the controls properly than rush to implement something just to meet a deadline because that way then that control is likely to be implemented ineffectively. So what I like to do is flip it on its head and say right work on the low hanging fruit first, do the, the quick and easy things that can be implemented quickly and get all the any associated I and some changes done efficiently and quickly get them put to bed. Then deal with your medium sized things, you know, um, that I, I, I can't sort of say what is a small, medium and large at this stage. But, you know, whatever in the grand scheme of things, you can work out what's low hanging fruit, what's, what's moderately difficult to do. And then lastly, what are the big things? What's the big stuff that we need to do? And by dealing with the medium sized changes next, that really allows the decks to be cleared then to focus on those last few big, the, uh, big things that, that need working on. Um, when you've got those larger changes and, and all the things then, the big stuff that you do need to take three, six, nine months even maybe in some cases, uh, you've got to realise, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You can't do everything all at once and, and you're not going to be able to sort of rush towards a transition deadline with knowing that you've got all of these, um, you know, large changes uh, and for the warning I've just said, better not to rush it, a deadline and, and do it ineffectively. So we would recommend sort of using a, a smart objectives approach and, and a staged implementation to those larger changes. So update your SOA to indicate that the control is applicable, uh, but the control is not yet implemented and then cross-reference to an objective. So how do you do that? Well, Let's just say we've deferred an objective to do something or other. Um, then that objective would look something like this, where you can prioritize it. Break that particular objective breaks down into four steps. Um, and these objectives all achieve different things with obviously an action plan associated with each, what measures of success, and then obviously the, the target date when each of those uh, elements. So if that particular objective was to achieve um, something in your SOA document that you said, you know, it's applicable to us, but we're, we're not, re not there yet, then eventually when this estimated completion date for everything is all done that's the date at which you can then declare well we've done all of that we've broken this down we've handled it in a controlled manner we've now reached this point we now know that all of the steps that were appropriate to take to implement that control are now all in place. We can now officially go back to our SOA document and actually update that, say, not only is that control applicable to us, but that control is also now effectively implemented. And then you can then declare that to your cert body to say, right, OK, that control, when you next come on your next visit, is now a control that uh, we can now include in scope because we've now done a proper job of actually planning it out as part of a, a controlled objective. So just to recap some of the key things about what needs doing, uh, again, um, when, it, when transitioning to the new standard, make some adjustments to your risk, risk revisit your risks and update any uh, Annex A controls. Uh, 
subsequently then if any of those new risks you've introduced trigger or the need to do a risk treatment obviously you can um, trigger that risk treatment and monitor those as part of your normal ongoing risk assessment and risk treatment management uh, process uh, again, we've talked a lot about, you know, reviewing and updating the existing documents, uh, initiating the change process and the ISMS change process. And again, more importantly, making sure your SOA document not only uh, it maps to the new control structure, because remember, we've got now the A5, A6, A7, A8 with the grouping of controls. So your new version of the SOA has to reflect that new control structure. Uh, again, don't forget training and awareness. You know, you update your policies, your procedures, you bring in new procedures and that to meet what the control requirements are. Don't forget to develop any necessary training and, and then obviously any uh, specific roles and responsibilities and, and training um, uh, for, for the roles involved in, in the operation of those new processes. Lastly, the certification process, you know, uh, contact your cert body, ask them, you know, what evidence do they need to uh, now introduce these new controls in scope. Generally, they'll ask for some of your mandatory requirements and in addition, the um, any evidence against the new controls. And like I said before, if you've not got to implementing any of the controls, using that smart objective approach and documenting that in your SOA is a good way of saying, well, we haven't reached that yet, but we've got a control plan on how to get there. Um, audit it as well. Uh, make sure that you audit those new controls, make sure that they're effective and that they work for you. And then obviously, if those audits find any um, non-compliance or areas um, where people aren't following the new process, obviously take whatever um, action uh, on addressing those non-conformities. OK, so that's a little bit about the the elements of uh, transitioning to the new standard. Um, just want to give very briefly some examples of some of the things that myself as an auditor come across either in pre-certification audits um, or uh, internal audits where we've been looking at um, the new uh, standard where they've transitioned from the old and uh, just share some of the big um, things that generally I see that people make mistakes with. Um, so again, going back to threat intelligence, um, one of the things that I often see is uh, a misunderstanding uh, really what effective threat intelligence process requires. Uh, so quite often um, we often see lack of uh, or limited intelligence gathering. Um, you're, you're threat intelligence process, if you decide this is an applicable control, is only as good as the intelligence you gather. So again, I go back to its, pro, its pre, predecessing control, um, which um, is uh, 5.6. You know, make, make yourself part of cyber security groups, um, et cetera, et cetera. Gather as much information out there uh, because you know, IS groups and newsletters is a good way of gaining intelligence outside the organization. And it could also give you some insights, valuable insights on how to treat some of these threats, you know, because many companies that have come across these particular threats will often say, well, this is how we dealt with it. So, you know, don't reinvent wheels. It might give you the necessary um, uh, clues as to how you can deal with it internally within your own organization. Uh, but a lack of limited intelligence gathering that will obviously lead to poor vulnerability management because if you're not learning about the threats, how can you be putting corrective measures in place? And then obviously as a result of not doing that, that can obviously lead to uh, unidentified uh, and uh, poor risks. Uh, in, inadequate evaluation of effects or of significant threats. So you might have all the best threat intelligence gathering in the world, but if you don't evaluate those threats effectively um, and don't do proper evaluation as to what impact that has, um, then obviously that is going to lead to a really sort of inadequate TI process. 
um, and also keep records of any discussions or any evaluation activities that you do as part of threat intelligence. And then lastly, on this one, one of the things I often see when I'm evaluating and auditing uh, TI process is uh, reduction, uh, last, lack of test evidence in, in showing that they've actually reduced those vulnerabilities or tested them. Um, and I'll just refer to a client I worked with last year. Uh, they do a lot of defense related work. And, and in fact, threat intelligence is actually a mandatory reporting requirement for them. They do MOD work and they have two tiers of uh, vulnerabilities. They have um, mandatory and uh, informational. Uh, the mandatory ones, their their clients do in fact expect them to report what they've done about it, what corrective measures and what testing they've done to actually reduce that threat uh, and vulnerability. Well, the common theme I see uh, is ISMS change. Um, obviously, you know, understanding what the impacts of introducing new controls are. Um, so that means not adequately documenting the impacts um, of new controls. Um, I mentioned it earlier on an earlier slide that the risk assessment is the driver why controls become relevant. They are selective um, and uh, policy and procedure changes um, do need to be documented adequately as part of the new clause 6.3. So I often see things like missing risks. Um, now, like, like I said, uh, you don't have to justify every control in your risk assessment, but the what I'm talking about here is quite often I'll say, you know, a lot of controls that they've said in the SOA document are relevant, but I can't see any evidence at all that in or justification in the SOA as to, you know, what risks um, are actually uh, resulting in the use of that control. So they brought the, the control in, but no risk to, to cover it off. Uh, and also, again, you know, this is why I stressed about training. Uh, quite often, uh, organisations will roll out new ISMS policies, procedures, not really give adequate consideration to training uh, of relevant staff who have to implement and operate to those new controls and requirements. Last one, big one, this uh, supplier management. Like I said before, cloud service providers is now a huge uh, culture shift in a lot of ICT environments. Um, generally across the board, we do often see weaker in effective supply management controls. But one of the things uh, I often see now that the new ICT requirements have come in is really a lack of a robust process around onboarding of critical supplies and particularly uh, and critical can be non ICT suppliers as well. But you know, there's a lack of uh, really an acceptance, uh, uh, an onboarding of, of ICT critical suppliers, particularly where you're outsourcing SARS, uh, IAAS and, and PARS service providers in particular. Um, lack of controls around the cl cloud service providers themselves, you know, not, in, not doing if enough due diligence and uh, effectively uh, not doing enough assessment of the cloud service providers capabilities. Um, that leads on really to the next one, which is approaches selecting good suppliers the due diligence itself. And, and in some cases, I've even seen organisations completely bypass IT completely. So they've got a way of onboarding suppliers and they've got a process for it, but nowhere does the IT, uh, you know, the information security requirements of our cloud service providers, uh, or even if they're buying like SARS applications, um, they'll, there's mechanisms where they'll be able to procure uh, buy SARS uh, applications, but IT have no involvement or even no knowledge that these parts of the business have, um, you know, even procured such systems. So don't bash, bypass your IT if you're doing good supplier management and proper cloud service provision and, and cloud service information security. And lastly, little evidence of, of supplier reviews, you know, uh, can't stress that enough, particularly with cloud service providers. If you've got an SLA 
that a cloud service provider has to comply with, make sure you can evidence that you are monitoring that supplier's quality of service and um, you, that you're monitoring that and, and reporting on it on a periodic basis. So in conclusion then, um, the key points, so hopefully I've covered a little bit about the background and evolution, talked about the IAF communication on climate change, don't forget that. I've talked about the changes in the core requirements and control structure, um, hopefully giving you a bit of an overview of what each control is and how to generally manage a transition. And I've given you some of the top three examples of the weaknesses that I've generally seen in, in transition audits from the old to the, the new. There are some new challenges, uh, particularly, as I say, with, with um, cloud service, uh, in particular on the suppliers and, and that. So hopefully that's given you an, a, a few pointers of things to button up tight uh, in your own organisation. OK, so... How can Certikit help you then? Um, so we offer a range of products, as I said before, we've been around since uh, 2010. Um, we offer a range of products and services really to help organizations meet the compliance and cybersecurity objectives. So we, we um, provide a number of comprehensive toolkits. Um, so that gives you all the documents, templates, and guides needed to comply with your chosen standard. Um, most of our, our core, core toolkits are 27,001, 9,001, 14, 27,701, etc. So uh, you can sort of look at our website to get a comprehensive view of, uh, of all the different toolkits that we offer. Um, the toolkits have a perpetual license and an ongoing support package. Um, and uh, with the purchase of a toolkit, you get unlimited email support. And uh, as we update the toolkits periodically, we've got a new one in the pipeline uh, soon, particularly for the 27001 standard. Um, those updates uh, become available to you um, uh, once you become a toolkit user. Uh, we also offer a logo replacer service. What this is, uh, if you want to personalise your your toolkit, um, now what what uh, you can do is you can get your logo put into the uh, actual toolkit documents, and uh, there is also uh, your business name um, in the Word and Excel documents that you receive um, as part of that particular uh, branded uh, type of toolkit. Um, if you do purchase it online, you can simply um, fill on the online form that goes with the, the procurement of that toolkit. Now, ISO services is an area where Ted and myself are, um, you know, very active. Uh, you know, we do a number of different services from gap assessments uh, to help you on your journey. Uh, we can do them to as transition gap assessments or we can do full gap assessments against uh, particular versions of the standard. We also offer um, ISO consultancy services, uh, which is uh, from um, full implementation support. Uh, of your project. So if you're doing 27,001 or 9,001 or any other standard, to be honest, uh, from scratch, we can handhold you through that process um, or we can do a, a, you know, sort of ad hoc support if you if you want uh, as well. The other th services which are growing uh, are internal audits um, where we can actually manage your internal audit program on your behalf, if you particularly if you don't want to um, uh, employ your own internal audit team or um, or whatever, we, we can do those on your behalf. And we also can do pre-certification audits uh, if you're on uh, getting towards um, to a certification state. Uh, this is a way of confirming uh, whether your, your readiness, if you like, uh, as to how successful you will be in a, in a, you know, a proper cert uh, uh, certification audit. OK, um, got a cyber awareness training platform as well. Um, the cyber awareness training platform uh, allows you to um, 
calculate, reduce and monitor human, cy human cyber risk within your organization. Uh, it's an annual subscription uh, price per user um, and it comes with uh, cyber security awareness training. Uh, it's also got phishing simulation, breach monitoring, um, some side benefits as well as it can do things like policy management uh, and real time uh, reporting. Uh, and we actually use this ourselves within CertiKit for doing our ongoing uh, security awareness uh, training. Yeah. yeah, and as I say, we can support you if you are on a transition journey from the old to the new. We can actually help you with doing some transition internal audits. Uh, that will make sure that, you know, I mentioned the October 2025 deadline. Uh, so if you're on that journey and want to confirm how things are all going, uh, you know, please feel free to contact us and, and uh, we can uh, we can help you in uh, assessing that. Uh, before that date. 